to keep the speed going. and get the recording going. And if we're all set, then I'm going to turn the floor over to Mr. Chris Conway. Good afternoon and welcome everybody to our first Colorful Conversation. I'm Chris Conway. I'm the Executive Director of the West Hartford Chamber of Commerce. I would like to start by thanking our sponsors for today's event, our gold sponsors, Liberty Bank and the North Star Realtors, and our technology sponsor, Westfield Bank. I would like to start by giving you a little history of the Minority Business Network of the West Hartford Chamber of Commerce and how we uh, came up with these colorful conversations. The Minority Business Network uh, was suggested going back a year ago uh, during a board meeting where the, the Chamber Board um, looked at itself and looked at some opportunities for growth and expansion of our organization. And we realized we had tremendous opportunity uh, within uh, by serving our minority owned and represented businesses. Uh, from that meeting, um, Christopher Clark, who is uh, currently serves as the chair of the Minority Business Network, suggested uh, the formation of a committee, which was formed in February of 2020. Um, unfortunately, that group was scheduled to meet the day that the governor had to shut the state down because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And back then, we thought that this was only going to last maybe 60 or 90 days. And we decided um, that we would wait till we could be in person before we officially launched uh, the committee. Um, on May 25th, 2020, uh, things changed. Uh, the killing of George Floyd uh, caused us to look at our organization and how we could be a voice in uh, serving uh, our minority community a bit better and being part of the solutions to the, those concerns. Part of that was the chamber taking the steps to issue a statement about the killing of George Floyd, about the protests that were going on, but at the same time condemning the, uh, the violent and vandalist uh, ones that were going on as well. Uh, we continue to, um, to also um, stand with that. Um, the Minority Business Network has been operating for several months now and has done a series of programs and been providing resources to uh, our minority owned and, and represented businesses. Um, as I said, it's chaired by Chris Clark and the group is made up of about uh, 16 business owners and professionals in the area. Um, today, we chose today very specifically for our first colorful conversation. Uh, uh, yesterday, our local officials were all sworn in at the state capitol, and we have all four of our representatives uh, at the state level with us today. It is, was also to, to be the day after the certification of the presidential election. We could not have known then what a historic day yesterday would be. Um, but we are we are here now, and we are going to move forward with this with this program. Um, I am looking forward to the conversation with our elected officials, moderated by Chris Clark, and hearing from our citizens on how we can continue to serve our community and support our minority-owned businesses. With that, it is going to be my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Mayor Sherry Cantor. Thank you, Chris, um, and thank you all for joining in uh, this conversation. Thank you to the leadership of the board uh, for recommending that this be an important part of uh, moving forward uh, and growing uh, the community and the chamber. Uh, thank you, um, Chris Clark, for your leadership um, on the Minority Business Network. Uh, and I think this past year, and it's interesting that this was supposed to start a year ago uh, and what a year it's been and how eye-opening it's been in many and, and many uh, issues of um, that are directly related 
uh, to minority rep, um, challenges uh, with healthcare and access to capital and, and so many things that uh, define how easy it is to get a business up and going and keep it going. Um, the PPP access, all of those things were uh, much more challenging uh, for, for many minority owned businesses because they didn't have some of the legacy, they don't have necessarily the capital um, or the bank relationships. So um, it's networks and it's really important for us to develop and strengthen those networks. Um, I know we're all tired today for so many reasons, but especially tired because I know like most of you, I probably, you didn't sleep last night. Um, uh, I surely didn't. Um, it's a heavy and sad day. Uh, there's no going back to, to undoing what we saw yesterday. Uh, and, the uh, and the, you know, peaceful transfer of power, um, is no longer our, our, our legacy, uh, in the United States of America. I have received, um, numerous contacts from international connections that we have, and it's just, a, it's just so, so, so heartbreaking. Um, but on the flip side, we've got really positive days ahead. You know, we've got, uh, so many wonderful people that are working on the science to end this uh, COVID. Uh, we have fabulous elected leaders that are re ready to serve, and uh, we're so honored to have uh, them part of this uh, of this panel. And they are ethical, hardworking, um, empathetic, and uh, really uh, prepared, smart. Uh, people and I'm so grateful for their for their service um, and I think it shows more than ever how important leadership um, is and and what a responsibility it is and how much it matters so um, again thank you all for being here thank you to this delegation and um, and again thank you to the chamber and the sponsors uh, and I'm honored to be uh, the, um, an elected leader and I I know I take my my role very seriously and I um, anyway so I, I thank you all for the from the bottom of my heart. Uh, better days ahead, for sure. <laughs> Thank you. Back to you, Chris. Right. Well, thank you so much, Mayor Cantor. Uh, and you know, I want to take a quick moment to introduce myself. I'm Chris Clark. I am the chairman of the West Hartford Chambers Minority Business Network. Uh, and I am honored and excited to be the, your moderator today, uh, to, to be able to be the voice that helps connect you, know, you to the, these amazing representatives that we have here in Connecticut. And I don't want to spend very much time on myself. I'd like to just dive into introducing our panel to you today uh, and echo what Mayor Cantor said. You know, we have a fabulous panel of leaders who are ready to serve and ready to answer your questions and you know to share their thoughts on on the go forward for our state and their involvement uh in helping to support minority businesses uh first i'd like to introduce derek slap uh state senator derek slap was elected in the special election in february 26 of 2019 to represent 98,000 rep uh, residents of the fifth state di senate district to of the towns of west hartford farmington Burlington, and the western portion of Bloomfield. He had previously served one term as a state representative in the 19th House District, serving constituents in West Hartford, Avon, and Bloomfield. Derek makes his home in West Hartford with his wife, Alex, daughters, Maggie and Zoe, and his son, Charlie. He is vice president of advancement at the Village of, for Families and Children, working to support families and communities in the greater Hartford area. Derek is a lecturer at Sacred Heart University and has been a lecturer in political science at Yale University and an adjunct professor at Quinnipiac University, Central Connecticut State, Southern Connecticut State, and Eastern Connecticut State Universities. In 2017, he won the ARC Angel Award from ARC for its advocacy on behalf of people with disabilities. Derek, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Chris, and uh, thank you to the chamber. Thank you to our mayor and to uh, our um, delegation members. Um, we have a fantastic group uh, of state representatives who, um, there, there was a really inspiring photo of them yesterday after being sworn in and they all struck a pose and it was really awesome. 
state. Um, so I, I'm excited um, for the session ahead. And I don't want to take too much time now because I do want to spend more time listening um, than anything else uh, today. But, you know, I would say that I think one of the big themes of uh, this coming legislative session that started yesterday is recovery um, from COVID, of course, and also growth. And, and part of that is going to be um, lots of conversations and a focus on equity. Um, and certainly in economic development and business, that's just one piece of it. Um, but in healthcare, in education, and in housing, we are gonna be applying the lens of equity when it comes to all of these issues. And every committee, um, the work that we do, we are gonna be thinking about how we can make Connecticut a uh, fair, more equitable place uh, and how we can root out systemic racism and fix uh, wrongs that have um, you know, been put into state statute in many cases uh, for many decades. Um, you know, we've made some progress. We were one of the only states in the country to um, to turn the, um, the the momentum that came from that tragic incident with George Floyd into actual legislation uh, this summer. But there's a lot more work to do in the areas you know that I mentioned, and in helping um, minority-owned um, small businesses. So, and, and I have you know some ideas about how to do that. I'm sure my colleagues do as well. Um, but I'm also really eager of course, uh, to listen to uh, other folks and, and to really gain, you know, uh, kind of best practices and, and put that into um, into action. Um, I guess the last thing I'll, I'll say, you know, I certainly don't want to um, be accused of filibustering, which uh, some of my colleagues do do, um, not on this call, of course, but, um, you know, I think that the Lamont administration um, has made some good steps over the past year and even just recently in the past month or so in terms of setting up a a uh, minority-owned small business office within DECD, um, you know, establishing some grants and a, a loan fund for uh, minority-owned businesses. Um, and there are just a recent round of grants that are going to be awarded, I think it's um, next week, to small businesses. So we need to do more of that. We need to fund that robustly in this coming budget and not sure, not, you know, um, just have adequate funding, but I think really make sure that we invest in that as, um, you know, as we go forward to rebuild the economy. So I can, uh, you know, leave it there, but just want to, again, thank you for organizing this uh, this terrific event and um, look forward to uh, to listening and learning more. Well, thank you for for that brief introduction, Derek, and, and thank you for joining us. You know, I am also excited to introduce Jillian Gilchrist. Jillian Gilchrist was elected to represent the 18th district of West Hartford in the Connecticut General Assembly in 2018. Prior to becoming a state representative, Jillian served as the Director of Health Professional Outreach for the Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence, Chair of the State Trafficking in Persons Council for the Connecticut General Assembly, Executive Director for NARAL Pro-Choice Connecticut, and Director of Policy and Communications for the Connecticut Alliance to End Sexual Violence. Jillian holds a master's degree in social work with a focus in policy practice from the University of Connecticut School of Social Work, where she has taught political advocacy. Jillian currently teaches for the University of St. Joseph, University of Hartford, and the Sacred Heart University. Jillian resides with her two children in West Hartford. Jillian? Thank you so much for having me today. And I echo um, the comments made by both Chris and Sherry um, and Derek that, you know, this is a dark day. And so I just want to give space for that for a moment um, as we all struggle to come to terms with what we witnessed yesterday and how, how we move forward. Um, I also want to thank you for putting together this conversation um, with, and I'm so happy to hear that it's going to be an ongoing conversation. Um, here in our community and our state. Um, I'll, I'll echo what Derek said. I think the focus of the 2021 legislative session is going to be on recovery in the state of Connecticut. And for far too long, we have had discussions about Connecticut's um, deep inequality, um, educational inequality, economic inequality, housing inequality, healthcare inequality. And the, the time for conversation is over. It's, it's the time to act and we have that opportunity as we move forward um, 
as we continue to deal with and um, come out of this COVID pandemic. Um, so today I'm really interested in listening and learning from you all, um, interested in understanding how COVID um, and the pandemic has impacted your businesses, how the pandemic relief efforts such as the PPP have either helped or hurt you. And then also interested to learn more on how Connecticut's ongoing minority owned business supports um, help or hurt you all. Um, I've heard in the past that some of these programs can be hard to access. And so I'm interested to learn um, if that is uh, something you find and if there's ways that we can support you um, at the state legislature. So thank you again for having me and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Jillian. And to your point you know, regarding access, we, we do have some questions and some concerns from, from people who have submitted uh, some inquiries to us. So we're, we're chomping at the bit to, to hear your response. Uh, but what I'll do is I will introduce Tammy Exum. Uh, Tammy Rush Exum represents the 19th district, which includes portions of West Hartford, Avon and Farmington. Representative Exum was elected in a special session in April of 2019. Tammy currently serves as Deputy Majority Leader and serves on the Commerce and Higher Education and the Employment Advancement Committees. Her other leadership roles in the community have included Vice Chair and Board Member of West Hartford Public Schools Board of Education, Coordinator slash Facilitator of the Parent Leadership Training Institute, in West Hartford, Windsor, and Middletown, uh, board member of Unified Theater, president and executive board member of Special Education PTA, and early childhood council uh, coordinator in the town of Windsor, where she worked collaboratively with parents, early care providers, educators, and stakeholders to develop early childhood initiatives in the community. Tammy is a former elementary school teacher, holds a BS in early childhood education and earned her MBA from Clark Atlanta University. She worked in human resources for Otis Elevator Company. Tammy and her husband Earl live in West Hartford and have three sons. Tammy? Hi, good afternoon. And thank you so much for having us um, on today. And um, like so many of you who have spoken before, um, I, I have to acknowledge that, you know, it's a bittersweet day. I actually came into my office here today at the Capitol and I was just reflecting, you know, yesterday, this time it was so exciting. You saw the pose that we struck because we were very excited to be um, sworn in outside on the grounds here. And then shortly thereafter to come into the office and to witness the scenes that we witnessed, um, it was hard to believe that that was uh, we saw dismantling, an attempt to dismantle democracy. But here in the seat of it, it's something that um, I hope and I don't think will prevail. Uh, they said such a thing has not happened since 1814 at the Capitol. And hopefully, prayerfully, we will move forward and heal and move on um, from this. Um, I, I was listening to the introduction and, and hearing about this group and when it was formed. And, and I am so glad that the minority... Uh, business community is coming together to have these types of partnerships and opportunities and support and resources. I am struck, though, that in a community as diverse as West Hartford, that it took acts that kind of prompted, I guess, in 2020, this formation. It is so important to have this formation, but like so many things, I don't want it prompted from tragedy. I want us to realize that we have strong businesses and that we need to understand how who you are so we can best support and, um, and provide resources moving forward. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation and the opportunity to know more and to learn more and to see how to be most supportive. Um, I also would like to say, I think the theme, I agree with um, uh, Derek Slapp and, and Jillian Gilchrist, their comments so far, really the, to me right now, the focus is on response, recovery, um, equity and access. There have been so many um, opportunities that we have learned um, from this pandemic that we are going to need to go into the session really ready to take on so many different issues, 
But at the end of the day, we also see a lot of disparities and um, we are able to now address some of these things. And I think we are so fortunate to have a delegation that is cohesive in its vision and we're willing to work together to do what is best for our community. Thank you so much for having me on today. I look forward to learning so much more um, about this group in particular. I'm su super interested and uh, thank you. Thank you again for having me. Thank you, Tammy. And we're looking forward to hearing more of your perspective. Last but not least, I'd like to introduce Kate Farrar. State Representative Kate Farrar was elected in November of 2020 to represent the 20th district in Southern West Hartford. She currently serves on the Finance, Higher Education and Employment Advancement and Insurance and Real Estate Committees. Kate begins her first term as a legislator with over 20 years experience as nonprofit advocate and active community volunteer. Most recently, Kate served as executive director for the Connecticut Women's Education and Legal Fund and led passage of landmark paid family medical leave and pay equity legislation. Kate serves as a board member for the Betty Knox Foundation and volunteers in West Hartford for the Aurora Foundation for Women and Girls and Food Share. A Connecticut native and UConn graduate Kate and her husband, Chan, live in West Hartford for its diverse community, commitment to education, and vibrant business and neighborhoods. Kate? Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you to my fellow members. And as said, thank you to everyone taking the time today. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, when I saw kind of the language and marketing this event, all I could think about and was reinforced yesterday was you know, an election January 1st of 2021, you know, doesn't suddenly change racial injustice in our communities and in our country. And that's really up to us every single day in our actions as individuals and in our actions as elected officials. And I even in our actions of coming together today on this Zoom together and saying that we want to do something together to support minority businesses in a new and different way in our community. And I think to me, especially going into this legislative session for the first time, it will certainly be different um, than it has been in the past for other legislators in this virtual format. Um, but it really doesn't change uh, the heart of the crisis we are still in and the crisis we need to address and also the fair recovery we need to create. I think in the committees that I'll be serving on, you know, I'm really most interested in making sure that our minority businesses, of which we have many in the 20th district, you know, are front and center as we offer more affordable health insurance products, you know, for our businesses, as we look at our budget and how we can create um, a fairer tax system and really how we're making sure that our businesses um, have the support to just grow and have the workforce that can um, really be uh, great workers for our economy moving forward too. Uh, so to me, this is about listening. We wanna make sure that we hear from you as we focus on fairness, uh, but it's, it's really about how we take all of the lessons um, of not just yesterday, um, but this entire, entire um, past years together and move forward um, with this focus on fairness. So thanks for having me and I look forward to hearing from everyone. Thank you so much, Kate. Yeah. So with the introductions uh, presented to you, I, I, I would like to just dive in and put forward the first question that we, we got from one of our, our community members. And before I do, I just want to say that, you know, thank you for recognizing that disparities exist. Thank you for, you know, being open to listening and to learning today and being willing to share your perspective to answer these questions. You know, so according to the New York Times, 40% of black businesses have closed during the first few months of the pandemic. This is in comparison to 21% of white owned businesses. Uh, Rock Connecticut has done a great job in creating a climate and culture that's promoted significant growth in the number of businesses being opened by minority populations over the last several years. The rise of COVID has caused several problems 
and some of these uh, initiatives have failed to hit the mark with minority-owned businesses. So we're hoping that these businesses will be a priority to bring new energy and ideas to the market. So the question at hand is, what additional opportunities, plans, and support do you have in mind that will promote a thriving environment for minority businesses during the shifting climate? And I want you to read the title and answer the question. Chris, we had some trouble with your audio. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry about you that. Re -ask, re -ask I'll, the repeat, I'll 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 re-ask the question. So, given the 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 shifting climate, what additional opportunities, plans, and support do you have in mind that will promote a thriving environment for minority-owned businesses? So this is Jillian, I'll jump in. Um, thank you for the question. Um, so what I've heard from folks, um, from small businesses, minority owned small businesses, is that the, the PPP really, really wasn't a support for them um, because of that need to have established relationships with larger banks and probably for other reasons, again, please let me know. Um, and so, I'm interested in various ways we can support through potential grant programs. Um, we are getting more money and we're expected to get additional dollars um, through the federal government. And so i um, interested in having conversations with my colleagues here on this Zoom, but also at the legislature on how we can ensure that those dollars um, get to businesses like yours and get to businesses like yours in a way that actually helps you and doesn't make you jump through additional hoops. Um, another interesting thing, and I think I learned it on another call held by the chamber, is that we do have a number of resources in the state through the Department of Labor and others that can help small businesses um, with developing plans, um, applying for grants like these, because we understand that you are likely not to have a team um, of folks who, who work the back office. Um, and so happy to provide those resources to folks um, as dollars come through so that you do have greater access to um, the resources that we in the state are providing. I, I would add on to what um, to Representative Gilker said in terms of some of the resources that exist with uh, DECD, and I think we need to expand those. Um, there is an office that is, you know, specifically uh, dedicated to uh, to helping um, small minority-owned businesses, um, but that that should expand, and we need to put more resources into that. Um, you know, uh, Kate Farrar, um, Representative Farrar mentioned, you know, about the budget, right, and about kind of how we in, in, in fair taxation, we're going to have a lot of tough choices to make. So we need to put our money where um, our mouth is. If we say we believe in equity, then we need to uh, invest in DECD is just one example. Um, and I would add that when we talk about economic development, and the governor talked a lot about that in his address, um, we also need to be looking at that through that, that lens of, of equity that I mentioned um, earlier. Um, and there's going to be a lot of conversations. I mean, the governor mentioned uh, cannabis reform as just one example of, you know, how do we go about doing that um, and not just repeating, you know, the, the mistakes of the past. Um, and education is another one and making sure that we do have that qualified workforce um, for um, all our businesses, but in particular for um, our small businesses as well. And one thing I would like to add is I am really interested in making sure that we know where who, where are our minority owned businesses? Who are they? Um, I found it difficult and had I went to multiple resources to ask where is the listing of the minority um, and I also asked women owned businesses um, in my district and it wasn't as easy as I'd hoped. So it makes me wonder when there are opportunities, when there are resources how are they pushed in if we have not identified where the businesses exist? So I think that's a really important piece to be sure that we capture and know where the minority businesses are so that we can be sure 
to connect the resources, which we do need more of, which I agree with what was spoken before, but it's hard to support. And, um, and I do see in the chat that one, that is one option, the shop um, black CT, but everyone isn't captured in that. Uh, I knew, I know some businesses that aren't there. So I want to be sure that they're all identified so that we can um, make sure resources are, are, are given in an equitable, equitable manner. To your point, Tammy, I think there's an opportunity with some of what our Secretary of State collects with the business information, but in regards to the reporting and access to that information, you know, how we use it to really set more goals and how we build greater networks, I think is critical. Um, but I would just mention, I think additionally, when we talk about kind of these new grants or new resources, I think the key is, you know, we know that pre-COVID, you know, there was just an underinvestment um, and undercapitalization, you know, for so many minority owned businesses. And, you know, it's coming to kind of terms in this moment of COVID that we're seeing the results of that. But it really is kind of a choice in prioritization, you know, as we look at new grant programs for businesses. Um, but also, I think in our own West Hartford community, you know, hearing from the chamber continuously and, and how we can build bridges um, between our businesses that we're in touch with and you all are in touch with to give them the best resources, I think, is a role that we want to play as legislators, too. Just can kind of continuing with the, with the train of thought regarding resources and existing programs, um, and and I think Jillian pointed out a little earlier was the gaps that exist in existing programs. Uh, for instance, PPP, where it, there was a large percentage. Uh, some some studies have estimated that it was as much as ninety to ninety five percent when looking at black and black you know, businesses that did not have access to PPP funds because they didn't have existing relationships with larger banks who were running the, the, you know, the access to these funds. What, what steps can, can you as representatives take to make sure that those gaps are filled and everybody has access? So one of the things a lot of folks don't know is that when the pandemic hit in March um, and the legislature stopped meeting, um, oh, is my video not on? That's so interesting. There we go, sorry about that. Um, and when the legislature stopped meeting, we, we were still playing a very active role. And so what we can do as legislators and what we do do as legislators is continue to have conversations with the executive branch um, as they're making decisions on how those dollars are spent. And now certainly as we have just entered the 2021 legislative session, we'll be using our formal committee process to do that. Um, but those conversations continue. And so as we begin to hear um, what is being, first of all, we can go and say, and we, we have, I'm sure, I know I have, and, and others have given feedback to the executive branch, to the governor's office on what worked and what didn't work. Um, I'm in constant communication with the chamber and with Kristen Gorski um, at, in, in our West Harper Department of Economic Development um, to hear what's working and what's not working. And then I relay that back to the governor's office. Um, and so as we start to hear what is being proposed with these new dollars, um, I'm happy to continue to have conversations with you all and fill you out on what's being proposed so that I can better understand why something would or would not work. Um, and then as we again go into our committee process doing the same, even though I don't serve on the Commerce Committee, for example, um, I am in direct communication with the chair and, and with my other, with my chair on the House side and then other members who serve on that committee and can um, give feedback and weigh in uh, as those decisions are being made. So there's a constant collaboration that goes on, even if you're not serving on that specific committee. Exactly. In the, in the committee process, as well as with the governor's office. Yeah, Chris, and I would add that there, there is constant collaboration too with our federal delegation and helping to secure, um, you know, funding. And I think it should be specifically, there should be some specifically earmarked for, um, you know, a small minority owned businesses. Um, so it's not just, you know, a free for all, like we saw, um, you know, with the, uh, with the PPE earlier where, and, and you did a good job of kind of documenting those challenges. So I think there's improvements to be made and especially, um, with President Biden and 
in a new Congress, you know, I'm optimistic that we're going to be able to get some more support for our businesses. One thing I'd like to add, and I'm excited, I, I'm going to be, I am a member now of the um, Commerce Committee. We just had our first organizational meeting, so there's a, a whole lot to learn. This is brand new for me. Um, I'm very excited about that, though. But one thing that comes to mind for me is, again, this is about networking and relationships. And I would love to explore ways to make sure that minority-owned businesses have a connection with banking, with banks, with ways to get the, um, have access to, to, to capital. And sometimes those relationships are not there. And that is a piece that needs to be established. Even when there were, um, I, I heard recently of a, a small business owner who had a relationship, a long relationship with a bank and went right out, was completely prepared, first round of PPP, and still didn't get funding at that time. But so many minority businesses don't have those resources and those connections. And that would be something that I'm interested in hearing how we could work with the chamber, what the needs are and the banking community to pull those partners together so that those connections can be in place when there are needs. So I think that is a, an area to definitely identify and bolster. That's an Chris, excellent it, I was just gonna add one other quick thing about, I think we hear from some minority owned businesses, particularly an access issue is, is potentially some language barriers. So I would also be interested, you know, to hear from the community and here as we come up with solutions, you know, how they are, you know, really cognizant of what some of those language barriers might be for some of our communities. And I know that was particularly the case with some of the quick moving um, elements that went along, even with some of our Connecticut grant programs. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I think we're, you know, really open to hearing, you know, how to, as Tammy said, how to make those better connections. But, you know, to me, I've heard especially about some of the language barriers. And I think we just need to be kind of come up with more creative solutions about how to make sure that that's included in any of the program implementation too. Yeah, I, I think to, to touch on what you just said, Kate, and you know, to tie that into what Tammy said. So the, the importance of a network and being innovative and creative and coming, coming up with these solutions. Uh, sounds like an incredible way. It's, to... You keep glitching out, just so you know. Oh, All right. Are you guys able to hear me now? Yeah, I, I'm just saying that tied together what Kate and Tammy were saying about the importance of. Can you guys hear me? Whenever you ask if we can hear you, yes. But then as soon as you start talking, no. <laughs> What a day to be having sound problems. Uh, I was just saying to tie in Kate and, and Tammy's points, you know, the, the, the incredible importance of a network and being creative. Um, you know, I'll move on to the next question. So hopefully you guys can hear me. If not, please let me know. Uh, the second question came from restaurateurs. So restaurants play a large role in driving traffic uh, economically, not just for themselves, but also to local retail establishments. Allowances for seating capacity in these cold months are an obvious challenge. The distance code doesn't allow for increases in overall capacity regardless of the hour seating and layout changes. What are both state and local plans to get increased restaurant capacity during cold months? What are some challenges you foresee to maximizing revenue for restaurants? Reps, if you had a hard time hearing that, I put the question in the chat. I can jump in again. This is Jillian. Um, and my video is on this time. Okay. <laughs> um, so I know one of the challenges um, that I've discussed with you all is that um, currently, when we're talking about capacity, it's also the 50% capacity, it's also applying to the outdoor seating. And so have been having conversations with the administration to ensure that it doesn't apply to the outdoor seating. I mean, if you've invested in heat lamps and, um, and ways to keep people warm um, outside, 
and that's and it's spaced the six feet, certainly you shouldn't that shouldn't then apply to the 50 percent capacity that was meant for indoors. Um, so I'll continue to follow up on that and have those conversations. I wish that it had moved um, sooner, um, but it has not. I'm also open, again, kind of how we've all been saying we're open to listening, but have had conversations with other folks in the community on, I know we've talked that there's been talk of gift cards, um, but are there ways to be creative in, um, can folks establish having food delivery once a week from a restaurant that they commit to for a certain amount of months? Like, are there more creative ways that we could help you um, to get new type of, of funding in from your customers who want to help but might be fearful um, of going into restaurants. The final piece I'd say is that um, I've had some conversations about other ways that we could be helpful in making the public more comfortable in um, actually eating indoors since a lot of the data is showing um, that there's only a few bad actors and that um, most folks are safe when they are eating um, in a restaurant. So again, more kind of questions than answers, but I'm hoping we can have that dialogue. Well, thank you for that, Jillian. Did, did anyone else want to, uh, to add some perspective? Chris, maybe I'll just um, add that, you know, we, I'm, I'm not an expert on capacity in restaurants. Um, there are, you know, that we, I think we can learn a lot from our restaurant owners. We have a lot of great ones in West Hartford. Um, but, you know, we are going to be in the net for the next three, four months. We, we can only probably do so much when it comes to capacity. And I think we're going to have to be there um, to help support uh, our restaurants with um, some grants and loans and, and financial support as well. Um, not just them, you know, but I mean, you look at arts organizations are really suffering. Um, there's a lot of these small businesses that we're going to have to, um, you know, we, we, we're going to have to find ways, creative ways to keep them afloat over the next few months. And capacity might be a part of it, but, um, you know, we, we also, of course, need to um, protect public safety. I would just reiterate, and I think we're, we might talk about this a little more on Friday with you all in the chamber with our federal delegation, but, you know, the crisis is not over. You know, we need government in its full role at the federal level and state level, and particularly federal relief um, for all of our businesses and the prioritization, as we mentioned earlier, from minority owned. But, you know, it's it's not, again, suddenly that January 1st came in and the crisis stopped or that the federal relief um, isn't necessary. You know, it really is an essential part of how we move forward. So to me, I think as a delegation, as a legislator, we want to make sure we're kind of making those connections for all of us and doing, you know, what's best um, to advocate for all of us here also at the federal level. Well, th thank you. Yeah. I, I just have a question, um, really. And I don't know if you have this, so I'm not putting you on the spot, Christopher. But I'm here. I'm interested in knowing what it is the restaurants would 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 need, what they would what they're asking um, at this point, because the, the virus is here. We it, we it is a public, you know, safety issue, and that's not changing a public health issue, and that's not changing anytime soon. We do need the federal funds, just as Kate said, and that's what we need to continue to advocate to make sure we can get what we need. Is there anything we're missing is what I guess I'm asking. And pardon me, because I'm not a restaurateur, but my understanding of the issue as, as it was relayed to me uh, was that you know, restaurateurs you know, understand that you know, we are in the middle of a pandemic. We are in the middle of a public health crisis, uh, but they're also trying to keep their doors open, keep their businesses running and keep food, not just on their patrons' tables, but their families' tables. Uh, and what they're running into is situations where maximum capacity is a set number. They may you know, make additions, you know, you know, as Jillian mentioned, put money and investment into heating lamps and outdoor uh, seating, but that doesn't affect their, their, their ability to have additional capacity or an additional seating number and therefore you know, maximize their revenue. 
Uh, in terms of the other challenges that they're facing, yeah, I, I don't know that I'm in a position to, to actually speak to those. Chris, I can just jump in. Um, we are going to have a deeper dive on this tomorrow with you folks and with Senator Murphy and Blumenthal. But certainly some of the things that have already been mentioned, the capacity issue with relation to the outside dining, not fully being an extension of, of the space is one. Um, the, and the other one is just the bad press. You know, that, you know, you read these, you know, practically clickbait headlines that it's unsafe to do so. And then if you read the article, it's really not what the article is saying. And, the, you know, the restaurants of having to battle that um, has really been something we've heard about multiple times. But like I said, we're going to hear directly from the restaurants. And certainly if there's anybody on this that's a restaurateur that wants to submit a question, you know, we can certainly try to address that. But we are having an event. So I might as well just plug the event tomorrow. So 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, uh, we are going to be doing a similar format with, with our restaurants. It's called Serving Up Support. And our four delegates will be there along with our um, Senators uh, Murphy and Blumenthal. I just want to add that in the chat, uh, Jorge Castro added a couple of things that restaurateurs are specifically looking for. Thank, thank you for that. Yeah, thank you for that. Because I believe, but maybe this, sorry, can I jump? Uh, maybe this is an issue across all um, small businesses, but I had had conversations about the rental relief in that while we've done a lot in the state with regards to rental relief for individuals and families, when it comes to small businesses, you are all still expected to pay your rent. Um, and so that's certainly an area I think that uh, we all could come together on to to work on as, again, more federal dollars come in and as we move forward in this 2021 legislative session to provide you all with recovery. So I'll, I'll dive into the, the third question that we had submitted. This one comes from a, a member of our minority business network and a business owner uh, in the community who owns a, uh, a bakery. And as a baker, her utility bills are naturally high. Connecticut has one of, or, or maybe the highest energy costs in the nation, especially with the new delivery charges. The, the understanding is that energy costs are only going to rise over the coming year. What are you doing to help with the affordability of running a small business? And I guess by proxy, the managing energy costs within the state. Um, Chris, I, I'll just be real brief. And it's a great question. I mean, we hear, I, I hear all the time about utility costs um, and uh, healthcare costs um, are, are huge uh, obstacles. Utility costs, we did, um, the legislature came in in special session uh, a few months ago and passed a bill that is going to, um, you know, taking back our grid. That was the name of the bill. Um, and that has a lot of good reforms in it. It's not uh, single-handedly enough, but it's going to create more public input in the um, rate um, process, the rate determination process. It's going to essentially make it more difficult for, I believe, rates to increase. It's We're also going to um, uh, really um, hold the executive's feet to the fire in terms of performance. Um, I think if you look at what happened with, uh, with Eversource, um, it has become, you know, it, the public utility part has been lost. Executive profits are soaring. Hedge funds are uh, the major investors now. The stock price is soaring. We've had a like a 35% cut in uh, the number of actual lines crews in the state of Connecticut. So, you know, if you are if you're an executive at Eversource, you're doing really really well. Um, but if you are a customer, your rates have gone up and your service has gone down. And um, that's a big problem. And we took um, a first step uh, this past uh, summer and fall um, after that storm, but we need to do more. And I do think there is a, w a will um, to uh, to do more this next session. And then healthcare, and that's a whole separate conversation, but um, I think you're gonna see some significant healthcare reforms. I think that issue was tipped in the past. Maybe it's only been you know progressives or certain folks who are talking about, um, oh my gosh, we have to do something about the healthcare system. And now I hear from small businesses all the time, their employees are being crushed by healthcare costs and they're being crushed by them. And um, 
you know, Connecticut, I think, is poised to be a leader. It says that, you know, we are the states are laboratories for democracy. This is a perfect example um, where we need to create a pool. We have got to open up, um, you know, uh, uh, for, for small businesses, um, some kind of relief. And I think that probably is going to be some kind of public option in Connecticut. Thank you for providing that information, Derek. That, that, that'll be incredibly useful. And, you know, I for one would love to see some of the changes that are coming down the pipeline. Did anyone want to add or did you, did you have anything that you, you want I just to wanted to add, I do think it's noteworthy. You know, we do have utility assistance for individuals and families and seniors in our state, you know, but we don't um, have as much of that significant option, you know, for small businesses. So it's a great question. And I think as legislators, you know, we can have that um, kind of being mindful of those needs as we kind of go into the session and are talking to colleagues about what needs to be put, not just in the budget, but you know, as real opportunities for our business community to get through this crisis. So again, you know, it seems you know kind of uh, like an, an obvious but um, necessary point to bring up. You know that we have offered this assistance to individuals and families and seniors, but um, certainly it is more of a necessity now for small businesses. So it's a great point, and bringing it to our attention can make sure we can do something about it. And I would just share that I serve on the Energy and Technology Committee, and so I will certainly bring this lens to that role. Um, and as we talk about utility costs, um, speak to the importance for small businesses and minority-owned businesses here in the state. <clears throat> Thank you, Kate. I'm so, pardon me. Thank you, Julian. Your, your advocacy is greatly appreciated. Uh, and I, I think it will be beneficial to our businesses and our, and our, our business community here in West Hartford and, and beyond. Um, Kate Coves, I know that we had a few people uh, in the audience who were interested in posing questions to the delegation. Uh, do we have anybody who was queued up? I believe that Allison um, is on her way onto the panel right now. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and spotlight you and we welcome your question. Oh, thank you. So my, my name is Allison Baraz. I'm a business manager of a periodontal office, which is a dental surgery specialty office. Um, we have two offices, in, one in Meriden and one in Waterbury. All of our staff are women. Many of them are single mothers. And my question is, or, or statement, the, the failure to have childcare available full-time is a huge problem for us. If schools are not open full-time, there really should be some sort of public daycare for children of essential workers. In our dental surgical office, one of our employees who is a single mother must bring her child to work with her. This makes our office less safe. The child can potentially expose our staff and patients to infection. However, the employee is needed to work in person. What will you do to ensure that essential workers have childcare and be able to do their jobs? Mm -hmm. I think that's a, a, a profound question and something that's on a lot of people's minds. I'll jump in. I would I'm wondering, were you was anyone able to access the programs that we did put in place um, in response to COVID through the um, Office of Early Childhood? Did did you and your staff know about those programs? Um, I, it's two qu questions because it would be helpful for us to know. Yeah. If, yeah. Yeah. So we did, we were aware that the YMCA was having a program, but other than that, we, we really weren't reached out to directly with, okay. with that information. So, so then I will, I'll go back, find out more um, in terms of would you all qualify for that? And then to me, the issue, one of the issues at hand is how do we ensure that folks like yourself and those you work with, know that these programs is, exist and get you connected to those programs. Um, so it's twofold and I'm happy to, to loop back. Um, going forward though, we're having conversations about child tax credits, but I'm with you in this current you know, state. I am unbelievably fortunate that my role is remote. Um, and so my child's here with me you know, when he's doing remote learning, um, but that is not the case. And what you're saying, I mean, that's what so many people are experiencing across the state. And 
we knew it, but we saw firsthand that school, not only is it important for the education that it brings to our youth, but it certainly is our number one childcare provider um, in the state and across the country. And so we do need to be doing more, but I will, I'd like to better understand if the programs we had implemented as a result of COVID applied to you. And if not addressing that, if they did, well, then why didn't we get that information to you all? And then with, with the children with remote, when they're doing a hybrid model, um, we are not aware of any programs right now that provide childcare on the days that the children are not in school. Um, so we, we were aware of some programs that were in effect at the very beginning of the lockdown, but we hadn't heard of anything since then. Yeah, that's wonderfully helpful because as Jillian said, I think it's about making sure we are not only, you know, connecting the dots here, but also kind of keeping up the attention on how, you know, we cannot have everyone get back into the workforce, especially all of the women who are unemployed and have had to reduce hours without true childcare infrastructure. And again, part of that we have to rely on our federal government for, um, but we wanna do our best, you know, to make sure again, that what you're facing in the immediacy um, that we're connecting you with the resources that are available. So um, we will, as Jillian said, you know, making sure that we know that you're having challenges accessing anything is critical so that we can help you. And I will just add, I, I, I totally agree with everything that Jillian and Kate said. And the only thing that I wanted to highlight, which is why these conversations are so valuable, is um, I didn't think about the, and haven't heard much about the hybrid piece and how difficult that makes it. So you may have them covered in, in a certain way when they're learning or, or occupied by school, but that hybrid piece, that's really important to highlight as well. Um, early on, I learned more about the programs that were for the younger children, for essential workers, but not the school-age children and not the hybrid piece. So thank you for highlighting that for us because that's the type of information we need in order to be able to advocate for the programs and supports that are needed by, by, by all of you and us. Thank you. I, I think that's you know, the recurring theme here is, you know, a lot of, of what's in place or has been in place historically, you know, we're realizing firstly that, you know, there, there are gaps in, in the existing coverages or gaps in the existing programs that we didn't realize were gaps until we're in the middle of the situation. Um, and also for some of the, some of the supports that are available, you know, it's based on network. It's based on people knowing and having resources you know, and access to the information. You know, very often through the Minority Business Network, we, we say you don't know to ask for access to a room or to knock on the door if you don't even know that the building exists or where the building is located, right? So you know, I, I think one of the things we, we collectively have to work through is being able to get the resources to people or, or, or at least the awareness of the resources to people. May, oh, may I ask a question? Um, I'm interested in knowing, um, are the needs up from the, uh, aside from some of the networking pieces, which we've identified, what are the needs that you've identified other needs within the minority business community, within this new organized part of the chamber um, that make it unique from other majority businesses, if you will? What are the needs? What are some things that you have, have identified at this point? Sure. So I, I'll, I'll talk about the impetus of, of the Minority Business Network here in West Hartford and, and kind of some of the needs that, that we see you know, as existing concerns for us. So you know, as a resident of West Hartford, you know, li living in this town, it's an incredibly diverse town. It's, you know, the, the elementary school that my children went through prides itself on the fact that there are over 90 languages spoken natively by the students that attend the school. But when you look at the existing business networks, they're not representative of that diversity. And it's not through some, you know, malicious design. It's, you know, at, at least in, in the way I, I've tended to articulate it is as humans, 
you know, we tend to be kind of tribal. We, we, we look for people that we have commonalities with because on some level, we've realized that there's a safety in numbers, you know, going back to our primitive mind state. So when you look at the business population and you walk into a, a given room or a given, you know, professional network, you know, or as deals are being made, people are mentoring, coaching, and doing business with people who kind of remind them of themselves. Yeah. And once again, very often, not, not in a spiteful way, it's just, you know, our networks are what they are. Uh, and so very often, you know, Black professionals, Latinx professionals, Asian professionals, you know, get left out of that group. So it becomes, you know, as the recurring theme seems to be here, about expanding that network and expanding those opportunities, you know, letting people know that the room exists and bringing them into the room. Um, so I, I think that that tends to be one of the the, if I can articulate just one thing, I think that's the major issue is is knowing that some of these things exist. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So do we have anyone else who, who was queued up to ask questions, Kate? I believe Kristen Gorski has joined us as a panelist. I, I think you had something, she had something that she wanted to share. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Kristen Gorski, Town of West Hartford Economic Development Coordinator. I certainly appreciate this really great conversation, specifically kind of geared around how do we uh, support businesses going into the legislative session, especially um, in terms of you know recovering from COVID um, and a lot of different processes, as well as opportunities that we can provide our business community to be able to um, support them with continuity to get through. But as I would like to ask a question regarding recovery. So as someone who works specifically um, to understand opportunities that are available to support businesses, you know, both from, um, from, from many different aspects, but most particular from a financial perspective, um, as you're moving into the session um, and, and trying to determine additional opportunities I do fear that, um, you know, a huge component of recovery is obviously getting people back to work and getting uh, businesses fully staffed and fully employed. I have a fear that some of the opportunities from a financial perspective that used to be available are no longer a tool in our toolbox. And some of the opportunities that may come about in this legislative session are more geared towards large businesses, um, you know, attracting and recruiting large businesses versus the retention of small businesses, meaning, um, you know, minimum 25 plus hiring, minimum, you know, uh, multi-million investment. So I would like to know what focus and how we can incorporate um, additional conversations or additional legislation that's more geared towards supporting the recovery of our small businesses and be able to get people back to work in particular making sure that those programs have a um, an aspect where it definitely promotes minority and women-owned businesses thank you So I think a huge opportunity this legislative session is that we are going to be virtual. So in the past, you'd actually have to come to the Capitol building to testify when a bill was being heard. Um, it's this whole networking piece again. Uh, for those who are linked to some type of association or in a union or participate with an advocacy group, they have more access to understanding when those bills are being heard, what bills are being heard, and when the public hearing is. Um, what I think is a positive this in 2021 is that that process has gone completely virtual. And so there is an opportunity for uh, small business owners, minority owned businesses to testify at the legislature like never before, because it's all going to be done by lottery. You're going to be told when you're going and you can log on by computer to testify on the importance of a bill or to your point, Kristen, on why a bill needs to be changed to include um, supports for minority owned businesses and small businesses. And so all of us here, and Derek had to jump off uh, because he had a childcare uh, thing he needed to address, but all of us here in the delegation 
provide e-newsletters, can be um, emailed at any time. You can give us a call, you can text. Um, and we, in our e-news, will be keeping you updated on the various bills um, that will be heard each week at the legislature. Um, I'll stop there and it's, now I'm gonna get it wrong, but it's Tammy. Tammy, you're on Commerce, right, this session? So, I am. Yeah. okay, so she'll have firsthand knowledge of what bills are being heard. Well, thank you for sharing that information, Julia. Kate, I think we had one more person who's queued up and, and had a question. We do, uh, Mr. Travis Bish. Uh, he is the owner of North Star Realtors and also one of our program sponsors for today. Um, so Travis, if you are there. Oh, I don't know if he is. Um, I'm getting, I'm having a hard time pulling up his video at the moment. Um, did we have uh, his question in advance that we could that we could run by the panel? Because I, I don't seem to be able to get his, his video on screen. So the question posed by Travis Bish is, what is our plan if this continues? Projections are that things should let up in the spring or summer of 2021, but we may be looking at more on a more ongoing situation so how will how are we preparing for this i think that we're doing things in a multifaceted way first um the optimist in me wants to say that our vaccination program will be underway and that people will um continue to follow the guidelines so that we can have much better spring and summer, warmer weather is going to be our friend as far as being able to reestablish, like for instance, restaurants being outside and that kind of thing. But what we have to do is also continue to advocate really with the, the federal government piece of this, because we're going to need funding. We're going to need, you know, to be able to support um, our businesses. Um, we need fund state, we need funds that we can work with the town and be able to support what the business needs are because this, this is a time unlike any other. And we have to be realistic that we know our budgetary restraints as a state. So our federal um, partners are going to really have to, we have to advocate and work with them and hope that um, they will hear us with this new administration. I'm also very optimistic that um, we will maybe see, have more of a program, a, a nationalized program um, so that we all are very clear about the resources that we will be getting. But I think that will be some of the critical pieces. As, as you mentioned vaccination, there was an additional question in the, uh, the Q&A section. And it came from Maria Brown. Uh, she asks, as an essential minority owned business, we remained open throughout the pandemic, purchased the necessary PPE and instituted protocols for our employees to remain safe during COVID. We would like to have our employees vaccinated so that our business is not interrupted if someone gets sick. Will there be vaccination information or help for essential businesses? So she, essentially she's inquiring about the resources that would be available for businesses uh, in relation to vaccination. So that's another piece where um, now we can take that information back, ask, and then loop back to you all. Um, they are, there is um, an entity that is looking at distribution, who the distribution goes to. I believe that they met today and we might hear about 1B shortly, which is the like 1A was first and then 1B. Um, so we, I don't have the answer at the tip of my tongue, but we can certainly get that back to you. Um, and to tie it back into the, the previous question um, on what happens if this continues, and we know, I mean, it is continuing now even in this next phase, right? Like, yes, the vaccines are coming out, but we've all been saying, like, we're still in this. Um, similar to what you were saying, Christopher, about, you know, folks don't even know something exists. Why would they go looking for it? That's actually how I felt for years about public policy. Um, a lot of people just kind of assume 
a law is the way it is because that's the law, right? They never question it. That's why I went into public policy. I, I always asked questions and annoyed my parents as a child, but you know, it's gotten me to where I am. Um, so that's our role as your state representatives and as Derek, as your state senator. So hearing from you all what's working, what's not working, hearing these questions, then we can go back, ask, ask the questions, provide the information, um, and then that's how change gets made. That's how laws get tweaked and policy um, altered. So to tie it all together, I'm happy to um, go back with my colleagues and figure out who is in 1B and then how do you, who is the contact person? There must be a contact person in the state right now where you can reach out to figure out, hey, we want to get the vaccine. How can we get on the list? And so happy to get that information to vote. That, that would be incredibly useful because I know that it's you know, a point of burning concern, particularly for the essential businesses uh, in the area. I would just reiterate, you know, kind of how we get through this really is, you know, that we really, you know, kind of trust each other and keep in this constant communication that Jillian and Tammy mentioned, because, you know, there is such kind of fast and furious decisions being made at every level and you know we want to be best informed from all of you so you know we that's what we're here for to figure it out all together um to kind of make the best decisions for our community so certainly don't view this as the one chance um to bring up those questions and as jillian said you know we will send information out but the questions from you all will make sure that we can make the best policy possible no, absolutely once again, relying on your network. And you know, one of the things that we, we say at the Minority Business Network is, this is about a process, not an event, right? So if you don't get your questions answered today, you know, we, we will absolutely uh, provide resources where you can reach out to us and we will get you in contact uh, with the panelists and, and provide them with the information they need to, to help serve the community. Uh, we are broadcasting live on Facebook and we have received a couple of questions uh, from Facebook. Uh, this one came from Craig Hansen. Any ideas how to infuse revenues to the rapidly depleting transportation fund? That's a great question and a hotly debated topic here in the state. Um, there have been proposals, as you probably know, um, in the last two years, um, I did support the toll proposal. Um, it wasn't just tolls, it was a very robust proposal, but it included tolls and um, that did not move forward. Um, so going into this next legislative session, as, as the individual on Facebook mentioned, we know that there needs to be more funding um, for transportation. So I think that that ties into this bigger picture look that we need to have as a state on um, equitable taxation, where are revenues coming from, where are they going um, to, because when it comes to transportation, not only is it a safety issue, um, it's also impacts businesses, um, attracting small and large businesses, but workers to the state, folks wanna know that they can get to work um, in a way that supports their quality of life. Right, and so there's so many um, elements that go into ensuring that our transportation infrastructure is strong. And so I do think it is part of this bigger picture that we, this bigger picture conversation that we need to have um, and that we will be having um, as we discussed at the beginning of this conversation on um, our recovery um, and how we make our taxation here in the state more equitable uh, to fund the things that we need to fund. I would like to say that I'd like to be, you know, take a little bit of Tammy's optimism a bit <laughs> and say that I would like to think that in the incoming administration, you know, we might see opportunities for infrastructure funding um, that Connecticut and other states can take advantage of um, to really address some of our longstanding issues with our own depletion of our funds. So I'd like to think that that could complement what Jillian is talking about for our own budget decisions, because you know, we really, I think as a 
not just in our own communities, but in our state, but across our country, infrastructure has been uninvested in. And, you know, there is a chance, I'm hoping with this new administration, um, to not only bring those dollars here, but really put people to work um, and address some of our climate change issues at the same time. So one, one stone that slays, you know, several birds, as, as it were. Um, I, I can say just from personal experience, moving here from, from New York, and that was one of the, the huge shocks to me was you know, the, the change in infrastructure. I, I managed to go 27 years without a driver's license, you know, but it became a dire necessity when, when, I, moved to, when I moved to Connecticut. Um, so when you look at you know, all, of the, all of the gaps that can be filled by expanding infrastructure, you know, creating jobs, creating an efficient way for people to get to and from the places they need to go, uh, combating climate change, you know, just making an available resource is absolutely something that, you know, we should be looking into. At least that's my two cents on it. Uh, we had an additional question from uh, Gary Doms on via Facebook. Does anyone on the panel have any information related to the small business grant program administered by Connecticut's DECD? Virtually all of the small businesses that rent space at my business applied for $5,000 grants and not a single one of them has received any information about the status of the program. They didn't receive any updates about the status of the grant. I know that money went really quickly, but, I, but certainly there should have been some type of communication so that they would understand whether or not they received the funding. I, I would be happy to help connect them with um, DECD to see if we could get some type of answers as even if the answer is that they don't have any more funding available, but that would be really, um, that, that would just be a respectful thing to have that information. That money did go very quickly. And we do know that um, recently with the stimulus package, there will be more funding um, that, that will be coming, but I'm not, um, I, I have to pull out the particulars of that, but I do know that there's, with the second round of funding with the PPP and the Economic um, Injury Disaster Loan, EIDL, there will be some funding available. But that um, the program that you're speaking of, I know the money has all been distributed, but you still should have some type of response. If you could put some information in the chat, I'll be happy to check into that, help you check into that situation. So if we could get Gary's information over to Tammy, that would be great. That'd be great, thank you. And thank you for, for offering to, to help out. Excuse me, Kate, uh, Kate, can we bring Bring uh, Kristen back on. She does have some information about the, the DC. Oh, excellent. I'll move her back. Oh, didn't she might be able to shed some light on it. Hello again. Um, so yeah, in terms of the DECD, the $5,000 grant, they are a little bit behind in terms of distribution of that grant. I have spoken with several business owners who over the course of the last, um, you know, honestly, 24 hours have started to receive notifications. Now, that notification that you're receiving a grant will come directly from um, either, you know, one or a combination of DECD as well as SoFi. I do know um, specifically some people People have found the email from SoFi in their spam. So make sure you are looking through or your businesses, Gary, are looking through their spam in every single folder just to see if they have some sort of notification from SoFi. Um, they are uh, trying to target to get out all notifications, hopefully by the end of next week. But again, they're a little bit behind. They had anticipated to have all of that wrapped up by the end of 2020, uh, but they're still actively working on that. For anybody that does have specific direct questions on whether they will be receiving a grant or not, I do suggest that they reach out directly to DECD. Um, so there is a business recovery hotline um, that we can also put in the chat, but 860-500-500. 2333. You can call that line directly and a staff person from DECD will be able to pro provide you the most recent update in terms of whether you have qualified or will be receiving funds or not. As always, you come through. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. So 
we had an additional uh, question from Facebook. Uh, this one came from Anissa Pesh. Uh, can we talk a bit about the rise of the COVID uh, COVIDpreneurs and what can be done to support them? These are people who are looking to open a business, fill vacancies, and uh, come across challenges. So people who are looking to, to start small businesses uh, or, or engaging in a, in a business venture during this pandemic. And, and are there any additional steps that are being taken to, to help businesses thrive for these up and coming uh, COVIDpreneurs, as you put it? I had never heard that term, so I'm really happy that it was explained. <laughs> now I'll start using it, so thank you. That was um, a good one for me too. <laughs> So I, I would think again, I mean, it's the networking, right? So connecting these folks to DECD and to the small business supports we already have in place um, to networks like these um, and then to their lawmakers, you know, so then we can connect them with the services we already have in place for anyone who wants to open a small business, right? Um, and then if there are unique challenges in you know, that present themselves as, as it relates to COVID and, and in this current climate, um, you know, we can certainly follow up and, and talk through that. But I, I would start with what already exists in the state for anyone interested in opening a small business. Absolutely. And I would look to my Chamber of Commerce to it kind of help me with resources and, and information. Um, I think this is a great place to get started. Um, and, and those networks and connections, I mean, if there's a theme for today that is running through much of our conversation. It's about networking and resources. Um, and I think this is a great place to get started. Thank you for the plug, Tammy. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so you know, we, we had an additional question um, from our, our resident baker, Naima at Crafts uh, Baking. And I think this was a continuation on her question regarding the uh, the the Eversource issue that she was having. So we'd love the opportunity to connect with someone at a state level regarding the regulatory practices, PURA, that allow Eversource to implement their current building practices that are gravely affecting small business owners, especially in the uh, in this economic climate. So I think it was more of a statement asking to connect with, with you directly. Uh, then it was a question. One thing I would also say is just to really uh, echo what Jillian mentioned earlier about testifying, about really listening for these opportunities and making sure that we communicate out the opportunities that will be coming up this session. And when, and, and making sure you put that information down in writing and put it, you know, uh, get into the lottery to speak, um, come to a public hearing because those testimonies are valuable. That's how we learn about what you're experiencing, feeling. It helps to really shape the policy. So I would really recommend um, that, that you write, some, write a letter and really get um, closer to the issue and, and be prepared um, for a hearing that will be coming up soon this session. And we can you know, try and help figure out when some of that will take place. So there will be a calendar um, and updates, but I think that would be very useful to do. It's impactful, not just for you, but for so many others that are feeling the same way um, about the issue uh, around utility prices and so forth. And I'd say as a member of that committee, if you want to send me an email to connect, um, then I can keep you posted on when those bills are coming up for a hearing. And so all of our emails are our first name plus our last name, which you can see um, up here on the Zoom at cga.ct.gov. CGA is Connecticut General Assembly.ct.gov. And so if you send an email, I'm happy to connect and then loop you in when um, bills uh, regarding Pura get introduced. And I just want to say one little thing. There's a dot between our first and last name. Oh, so it's so, first dot last. Yes, first dot last. We'll, we'll, we'll be sending it out as a follow-up. Well, we'll okay. make sure we include everybody. <laughs> we, got, we got it. Well, yeah, it, it looks like we are, are butting up against time. So I, I want to thank you all. Uh, thank you, Jillian. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, it looks like we, uh, it looks like Derek and Kate had to jump off. But I want to 
show our appreciation and extend our gratitude for you joining us today, for sharing your insights and sharing your enthusiasm and willingness to hear from your constituents as well as to be a resource for your constituents. Um, did, were there any closing comments or thoughts that you wanted to share? Just my pleasure. Thank you for having us today and let's keep the conversation going. I, I couldn't have said it better. Absolutely. And, um, and, and all the best as the um, minority business end of this uh, continues to, to move forward. May you get more businesses and more information and continue to network um, throughout the community. But thank you so much for having us. Once again, thank you for joining us. Uh, Chris, did you have any closing words? Sure. I just, uh, again, want to thank everybody. Um, and I just want to thank our delegation. Um, I've been in this role for just over two years. And you guys have just always been so accessible, so responsive. Um, and today is a perfect example of that. Uh, when the, the committee came up with this idea for this event, I, um, I, said I would take on the responsibility of inviting you to join us. And I think within two hours, all four of you had committed uh, that you were able to do it. So thank you for that. Um, and I will just reiterate what, what, what our leaders said. Um, if you've got a concern, the access is there to, to voice your concern and you should do so. Um, you'd be surprised how few people it takes to have a concern where action will be taken. And I've seen that over the years historically. Um, I just want to thank Chris for his uh, fantastic job. One, once we got the microphone thing worked out uh, for moderating today. Um, and uh, thank you to everybody for, um, for those great questions that really uh, spurned the conversation. Um, you know, I think that this, um, this series is called a conversation because it will continue. Uh, the plan is we will do one of these quarterly. Uh, if you do not already, please follow the Chamber's social media. If you're not getting our emails, just send a quick email to info at whchamber.com. We'll make sure we add you to the list so that you know of upcoming uh, forums and similar type programs that we will be doing. Uh, of course, I wanna thank uh, the chamber staff, Kate Cook, who made sure the right person was on camera when people were speaking, which is, is no small task. Um, and Jesse, who uh, was doing closed counting and uh, monitoring the chats there. So thank you very much for that. Um, with that, I just want to lastly thank our sponsors again, our goal sponsors, the North Stilters and Liberty Bank, and our technology sponsor, uh, Westfield Bank. Uh, and I did mention the event tomorrow. If, if you are a restaurateur or are interested in the support that uh, we are providing restaurants, um, you can check back at 10 o'clock. You can register on the Chamber's website. Uh, where we will have the four delegates again, along with uh, Senators Richard Blumenthal and uh, Chris Murphy. Uh, with, with that, certainly you can reach out to me at any time if you have any questions about the chamber. Uh, my contact information, as is the staff, is on the chamber's website, whcham.com. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have an amazing day.